Hey everyone, it's Mike Andes and you're listening to the Landscape Business Course Podcast. Today we're going to do a marathon of Q&A, probably take us, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 minutes and just try to answer some of the questions that came in on Landscape Business Course Facebook group. If you're not a part of the group, make sure you join and you can ask questions on the next Q&A. I wanted to make sure everyone has signed up for Landscape Business Course uh, the conference that we're having, Landscape Summit 2020. It's in January. Just go to landscapebusinesscourse.com slash conference or go to the homepage and just click on the conference tab. On there, you can see all the topics or at least the five main topics we're going to be covering. We'll have a whole bunch of smaller ones while we're there. But we'll be talking about the five, those five different uh, topics as well as there's a little bit of a schedule on there. Thursday, we start at 5 p.m. We'll be ending Saturday evening, and we'll have a special kind of event on Saturday evening together. So looking forward to that. More details to come over the next couple weeks. I'll be rolling out a more detailed schedule and topics and things like that. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and jump right into the questions. Uh, at the conference, by the way, we will be doing a lot of Q&A. If you were there last year, you know that probably 20 to 25% of the conference is literally Q&A because at at the end of each session, I ask for questions. And even throughout sessions, you're able to raise your hand and ask questions. The nice thing is this is not like thousands of people. It's only going to probably be 50 to 100 probably, I'm guessing. Uh, and so what's nice is that you're able to ask questions and everyone can hear you and really get uh, some really detailed questions answered. Uh, throughout the whole conference. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and roll through some of these. Again, this is coming from Landscape Business Course uh, group on Facebook. Brandon Tubick. So I haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't read all these questions, um, but I'll just go through them. And if I don't know what, what, uh, what the answer is, I'll just let you know. Brandon Tubick says, targeted Google ads to build density. Best strategy to implement we have used Google ads all season, but really want to dial in the proper demographic. So um, the major thing is your age that you have. You don't want to just target area because marketing lawn care services to 18 and 20 year olds is not really the best use of your money. So we usually target people 45 and up. Uh, again, this is going to depend on your local market and like who your, who your target uh, audience member is. Like who's your ideal customer? If you're going after more of a 30 to 40 year old that's a working professional because you live next to the headquarters of some massive law group or accounting firm, then you might want to change your strategy. Uh, but for us and for the, you know, Augusta, our target market it is 45 and up. So retired, affluent, residential, small, small, uh, 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 property owner. So that's kind of who we target. And in terms of building route density, I would just make sure that using Google, Facebook, along with EDDM, that's going to be the best way to usually get a dense uh, route, as well as putting door hangers on the neighbors of your existing clients. So you know, five or nine houses. So if you're in a new five, you do the neighbors of both the per if you view most this person's lawn, you're going to do door hangers on the people next door on both sides. And then the three people across the street, let's call it five around. Some people do nine arounds, uh, but that's a great way to build route density as well. Brandon said, continue with another question. He says, new client intake flow or sales funnel. We started using Jobber and realized it's not very visual, so we started dropping leads into a sales board in Trello at the same time so the team can stay up to date. We throw voicemails, notes, hold people accountable, etc. How do you guys do at Augusta? By the way, thank you for the letter. Would love to chat about having you out for zero turn next season if you're not crazy busy with the franchising. So uh, in terms of, so Brandon's basically asking, do we have a sales funnel? looks like he's using Jobber. It's not very visual for the sales funnel. And so they've been using Trello to make a sales board and things like that. So the beautiful thing about software is it makes your life easier. What I don't like about software is when you have to start duplicating inputs. So I, didn't, I, I hate having to put you know, customers into one CRM and then putting them into something else. Or if I do an estimate here, that's why like, I'm a, a, if people use QuickBooks, for example, alongside their service autopilot or another CRM is like, I do not want to have to be going between the two back and forth and like fixing things back and forth. Like if they don't sync across and they're not, it's, it's not a seamless sync, then I want to keep them separate. And the reason for that is because I hate double entry. I hate wasting time putting in 
into two different systems. Uh, and we have to do that on some things uh, because not every CRM is gonna have exactly what you want. So for scheduling for us, we use some other things, uh, other softwares. However, for a sales funnel, uh, we have it all automated. So with Service Autopilot, the only thing I like about them, the, the thing that I like them the most is their automations. Like without the automations, I'd probably use Jobber. Um, and just because ease of use and just user friendliness. But with automations, that's my sales funnel is because it's already automated. Like I build the sales funnel as soon as the estimate is, is created, they automatically go into the funnel and I know it's going to go through that funnel exactly the same way every single time. And unless they, unless they mark that estimate as lost, uh, then, or like, unless they reject the estimate, they're going to continue to stay in that sales funnel. And if at the very worst, they go through the whole sales funnel and they're not, they're, they've lost, we've lost the bid, uh, then they're going to go back into a monthly recycling them, recycling that estimate and recycling that lead to try to stay in touch with them. And that keeps them in the sales funnel all the time. So, um, in terms of, how to do that. Like I've never used Trello to be perfectly honest with you. I've, I've played with it, but we've never used it at Augusta. We try to keep it all as much as possible on one CRM. And so like if we didn't use a uh, service autopilot, we'd probably have to use some sort of other out of the box automation software and start duplicating things. And I, I just wouldn't like that. So we try to keep it all as much as possible on one CRM. AB says, hey, Mike, first off, I can't wait to meet you and, and being part of the first 10 Augusta franchisees, hashtag Augusta Nation. So AB is part, uh, he's in New York, Long Island, and so he's a franchisee of Augusta. My two questions are a bit evil, but nonetheless, I don't, I don't think you meant evil. <laughs> My two questions are a bit evil, but nonetheless, one, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, got it. Number one, in my territory, 99% of properties already have a landscaper. So how do I take those properties from their landscaper? What's the best thing to say or not to say to the property owner? So this is a, a case when you got to let your professionalism do the marketing for you. Like I am not an advocate of going after people's customers. Like there's a way to maliciously use Facebook ads and even Google ads to target the customers of other, other, uh, competitors. It's, it's not hard. Um, and, and use their names and your ads and everything, but it's, it's just like, I'm a b big believer of what goes around, comes around what you do, uh, is going to come back to you. And so like, I'm just not a fan of that. I want everyone in my market to do well, all the other landscapers, if they're playing by the rules, if they are uh, honest with their employees and honest with customers and doing things right. I want them all to succeed. So I'm not going to go tear them down. What I would say is that if 99% of the people in your market have a landscaper, it's a really good sign. There's lots of opportunity. You just got to make sure you're better than the other landscapers. That means cleaner trucks, more professional people, better sales material, better copy on your ads, uh, targeting you know, specific dense routes. So that way they always are seeing your trucks when really like, so I saw something really cool. One of the members was doing the other day where he made sure that he always did door hangers on the main streets of his town. So that way, like the main arteries, so that way his trucks would always be along those. So people from all the other cul-de-sacs and neighborhoods would always be seeing his trucks along those main you know, roadways. And that's how he spread and began to grow is always marketing along the arteries and like where a lot of the traffic is going. And so things like that, just being smarter, like even, even for example, at our local shop, we were talking and it was brought up like, okay, a lot of the landscapers locally are listening to the podcast and getting educated from Landscape Business Course. And they're starting to do a lot of the things and it's becoming harder to get these estimates or that's a reason why we might not be winning uh, some estimates occasionally. And so, but what I said is, you know, in, and so some of people, like even in your market, you might be doing something and a, a, a competitor starts doing the same thing. Like at the end of the day, if comp a competitor is copying you, you're winning. Because if they're following what you're doing, it means one thing. It means you're in front of them. And so it's not a bad thing. Uh, I want the industry to improve. And if what I'm doing is working and other people are copying it, it's going to be better for them, their employees and their customers. 
let's go for it. I'm all for it. But at the end of the day, if they're following what I'm doing and copying it, it means that I'm ahead of them and I'm always going to be ahead. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to figure out the, another marketing tool an, a year before them. By the time they catch on, I'll have something else. Like just one new thing at the end. You know, right now it's pay for performance. You know, by the time a lot of people are on board with that, I'll have something else we're figuring out and, and conquering. And so that's why, like, I'm so confident in the franchise working is that we'll always be one step ahead of the competition. So when it comes to a market that's saturated in your, in your mind, you think like everyone has existing landscapers, that's when you just got to be better. At the end of the day, that's, you know, you got to be better, better marketing, more professional, getting the bids back faster. Uh, if 99% of people have, uh, landscaping services, I can guarantee you 10% of them are looking for new services or at least price checking in the spring, uh, or they're moving, just people who are moving and getting, getting to a new neighborhood, they'll ask other landscapers for bids. You've got to be the fastest bid. You've got to be the most professional bid. You've got to be the, have the best systems in place to be personable as well as professional, as well as timely, as well as cost effective. And so putting those combinations and just being better is what's going to allow you to break into the market. Number two, once I find one particular landscaper in my area that isn't doing the best job, do I take advantage and grab all his accounts in my territory? I will be seeing you, God willing, on the 14th. We could discuss then. So uh, basically saying, hey, if you see someone weak in your market, should I go target all of their customers? I don't think so. Uh, again, let your work speak for itself. Let your professionalism speak for yourself. Let your website speak for itself. There's a really good chance that most landscapers in your market that just have a single truck or a couple employees and they just kind of do it on the weekends or whatever, like they are not going to look as good as you online. And usually they're not even going to look as good as you in person. If you have professional trucks and trailers and equipment and trained staff and all of that, um, but even online is a massive difference because most customers, mo the, if you look at the, the, the numbers and you look at the data right now, most consumers, even in the home improvement space, go online to vet the contractor. And so you being professional online, having a great website, having great pictures, uh, should being really uh, open and honest about pricing online, all of those things is what's going to separate you from Joe Blow down the street or from the landscaper that is quote unquote struggling and not doing the best job. And so you've just got to be better. At the end of the day, in a crowded market, it proves that there's a lot of work to be done. You've got to prove yourself that you're better than everyone else to get into the market. All right, next question comes from Kosh Josh. Did Augusta learn essay automations on your own? Which ones are most useful? If you did, if you used an outsourced source to build, help build them, would you care to share? Do you use Service Autopilot for anything other than routing, invoicing, employee tracking, damage cases, assets, recruiting, et cetera? Summed up, how can we use Service Autopilot more effective, most effectively? All right, so first question is, did Augusta learn Service Autopilot automations on your own? Yes. We never had anyone else build any of the automations for us. And the reason I'm a big believer in this and is because I truly believe that if something is super integral to your business, you need to know how to do it. You know how to build it. You know how to operate it. Like, cause otherwise you just become vulnerable. Like if I put the, put automations in the hand of some other developer or another company, cause there's third party companies that build service autopilot automations and I'm not against them. I think they do a great job, but for me, I want to know how to customize them. I know how, how to use them to the most of their, like the, the, at, using the peak, like as much as I possibly can. I want to be able to customize them to my needs as well as the needs of the franchisees. I do not ever want to have someone, my, my hands being tied because someone else built them and I don't want to have to pay them monthly fees to hold the key to those handcuffs. Uh, and so I, I'm not a big fan of, anything in my business, having someone else have leverage of, uh, against the thing that's core competencies. And with service autopilot, I feel like automations is the only reason we have it. And so why would I let that core competency of the CRM be dictated by a third party? And so with Augusta, all the franchisees, they get automation packages and that's going to be stuff that we've built that I've personally used. We've ran at Augusta. And so in terms of which ones are the most useful, I'll name a couple of them. Obviously the estimate follow-up is really huge. We have several different types of follow-up for estimates. Uh, 
let me see. So, though, collections, really important. Keeps your accounts receivable down a lot. If you have really good automations for collections. Automations for dispatch based upon, like, if you do treatments to let them know not to be on, on the lawn or put their pets out, that can be automated. Uh, also, uh, automations for dispatch for, like, dog picking up their, you know, dog poop, uh, and then letting, sometimes, you know, customers always say, hey, let me know when you're headed over. Well, instead of doing that manually, you can just have an automation do that. Other automations we do are things like when an estimator completes an e estimate out in the field, it'll automatically email the office and let them know that it's ready to be sent, so that way it's just really fast. Um, this is a whole bunch. We use, we use a whole bunch, and I think when you get started as an Augusta Lawn Care franchisee, we preload with about I think it's like eight, six or eight. No, it's like eight or 10 now. So anyways, we preload quite a few automations for the new franchisees, and then we will continue to give them more complex ones as their business grows. Um, summed up, how can we use Service Autopilot most effectively? Uh, basically, if you don't use Service Autopilot for automations, I would go use Jobber, just because it's not easy to use. It's a very complex system, really in comparison to other CRMs, it takes sometimes years to really figure out, even if you've been trained on it, to really understand how the system works and utilize it to its full capability. Uh, I would use Jobber if you're not going to use automations and service autopilot, just my opinion. Amity Morales asked, how do you handle customer complaints about breaking things at the property when there's no proof if, you, if it was your crew? Because if, cause if it's the crew... Because if it's the crew, we fix it, of course. Okay, so Amity's basically asking, okay, if someone, a customer says, hey, there's a damage case on my property, and there's, but there's really no evidence that it was your crew, at the end of the day, on these ones, it comes down to, do you want to risk a really bad online review? And so, and we're just going to assume that there's absolutely no evidence besides maybe it happened the same day as your crew was there. Or maybe even you don't even know that. Like, literally someone just convicts you of something. Like, if it's so obvious, like, for example, uh, the garage is smashed in, the garage door. And you can look at all your trucks, you can track them, and no one was by that house or... Um, there's no paint on any of the trucks or any damage and like the whole their whole garage door is like smashed open then obviously that's that's something i'm not going to do but if, when it comes to like he said versus she, he said versus she said sort of thing back and forth at the end of the day it's going to come down to how bad do you not want to have an a, bad, a negative online review and that's up to you do you if it's you know if it's a 200 dollars repair maybe you do it if it's 10,000 okay probably not so it just really is going to be how bad, you not want to have that online review. And then if you decide, look, if this is like too expensive, it's a $5,000 repair, and I don't think our guys did it, or at least there's no evidence of it. And then it's like, maybe you go negotiate, maybe you talk to the customer, maybe you start, you try to have like a third party come in and try to mediate between the two. It's going to depend on like, are, are they malicious? Are they really super mad? Or is it just like, oh, I, I'm, I think this broke the other day. Like, so it's every single customer is going to be a little bit different, but at the end of the day, it's really going to come down to how much, how bad do you think they're, like, how mad are they? Are they going to go make a horrible online review that's worth, you know, twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 of damages to your business and in, in, in terms of future revenues, or is it worth just paying 150 bucks and, you know, fixing the little edging or a little figurine in their lawn care or in their bed? So... That's really a call that you have to make on an individual basis. Uh, but again, having your trucks tracked, great way to do truck damage stuff. If people say that a truck was at a certain spot and you can prove that it wasn't, that helps. Uh, clock in and clock out on jobs, that helps to know timing. Little things like that can help sometimes on those. Keith Dodgett asks, what time does it start? Oh, okay. No, that was a, he thought it was live. Anyways, Cecil Perkins where do I store all my training videos and screen recordings? What platform do you recommend for this? So two different ones we'd, I'd recommend is if you use, you can use YouTube and just do a private videos. So that way people, only people with your login information for YouTube can access the videos or just use Google Drive. And then you can share certain users access and then like if they get fired or they leave you can just take access off so that way you don't have to change your your login details for youtube all the time marcus Luz love has a few questions it looks like 
Full service packages, con full service package contracts or no contracts. We don't do contracts, um, but we also focus mostly on residential and one-time jobs, so we do not do full service packages uh, at Augusta. We do, we uh, take that back. We do have some, but m we focus on uh, on just a one-time mows and clean up per service and treatments per service. We might sell them a treatment package, but we are going to charge them on each treatment, not like on an annual basis. Office administrative procedures and procedure to help with quoting, scheduling, how to respond back to emails, messages, and reviews. So again, an office person is an expense. They are an overhead, but they can make up for their, their pay in leaps and bounds. And so recently with Augusta Lawn Care, the franchisees, we've launched what's called Command Center, where we're going to answer their calls at our call center here. And that way they can be in the field, they can be doing estimates and not have to worry about hiring an office person. We're also building in the functionality to send estimates for them through Service Autopilot, as well as take calls and sell estimates, all of those things. And so it's a huge part, and that's why we've done it for the franchisees, to give them the value because there's a massive amount of overhead that comes with hiring an, an office person simply due to the fact that when you need them, when you need them to get started, is usually around like the three to 500,000 in, in annual revenue marker. But that's also a time when you don't need them full time. And it's tough to find a good part timer. So what ends up happening is you hire this person and literally half their day they are wasting just like texting or doodling or doing whatever on the computer. And so what we've done with command center is basically make it where they only have to get, they only have to pay by the minute on the phone. So that way our call center staff is efficient. They are um, always answering the call phone. It's not like you, you're not paying for someone to sit in an office that you're heating. You have to give them furniture and a bathroom and, and computers and have garbage and electricity and all these things. You can just be out doing your thing, all the field crew working, and then all the command center, or all the calls and estimates are handled by the office at the command center. So if, you, if you're not, obviously, if you're not a franchisee, an office person's a tough one because until you get to certain scale, you can't keep them busy. And usually I see between three and 500,000, like that's when people need to get their first office person in the door and start having someone you know, running estimates, answering phones, emails, all those sort of things, scheduling, all of that. And so uh, during that time is tough. Like if you, ideally you have a family member or like a spouse or something that can kind of fill in occasionally until, until finally you need someone full time. Uh, but that's a tough middle ground because their, their payroll is 100% overhead. It just comes right off the profit, profit margin. And so that's a tough one for a business kind of in that middle zone. And that's why, that's why you see a lot of landscaping companies, they top out at between 250 grand and 350 grand. It's because it's like you either jump past five and afford an office person, or you stay at around three, so that way you as the owner can do the office stuff, be out in the field, do the managing of the jobs, do the estimates and kind of be everywhere at once. And until you commit to having that office person, you're gonna continue to do that, and that will keep you from growing past usually about 300, 350,000. Best way to increase prices on clients who have been with you since the beginning. Low pricing due to not knowing how to price at the beginning. We don't want to upset them, lose them as they are our first supporters. So Marcus, there's going to be a new Zero Turn episode uploaded on YouTube and Facebook coming up here pretty soon. And I was at 116 Lawn Care in uh, Jerseyville, Illinois with Zach and... Jessica Dar. It's going to be coming out here in the next couple weeks. That is the next, you know, we've are we just posted several episodes, by the way, videos on YouTube and Facebook of Zero Turn, several different companies we visited. But in a couple weeks, we're going to be launching a new one and it's going to be that one. And in that one, we talk very much in detail about how to raise prices on your customers without them getting mad. And so if you haven't already, make sure you do watch those Zero Turn episodes. We just launched one called Ankeny Lawn Care uh, over from Iowa. And so definitely watch those videos. You'll get something out of those. But it, just to answer your question here, 
in terms of increasing the prices, just be very honest with your customers and how you want to pitch it is how does it, how does it benefit them? And so what you do is like, hey, look, over the past five years, we haven't raised your price. Here's the things that we have done. And you talk about, okay, we've trained our staff. We've implemented a better website. We've allowed credit card processing. We've in upgraded our fleet and our equipment and safety standards and all these things. And by the way, labor's getting more and more expensive. And yet all this time, we haven't raised your price. In order for us to be a sustainable business that can serve you for years to come, we're going to need to raise your price by X, whatever that price is, in order for us to serve you uh, and so that we can make this sustainable. And so even if you have to just be honest and look, we're, we're losing money on your job. And if they've been with you for five years and they love your work, most of the time they stay with you. Like the, you know, sending them a letter and a nice email and maybe a phone call, literally, I've, I'm seeing right now people that are using the letter on the course and things. We have the price increase letter that's on the course. We're, I'm seeing between 2 and 8% of people that drop services after getting that letter and email. And so uh, I'd much rather lose even 20% of those customers that I raise prices on, but knowing that the 80% that stayed on are now profitable instead of losing money. And, and, it's, and it is ethically right for you to be making profit on those long care jobs because if you're not, you're not running a sustainable business and you're putting the jobs of your employees at risk as well as the customer's uh, dependence and need for your services is going to be in jeopardy because, you know, if you go out of business, they have to go find someone else. And if they go out of business, they have to find someone So, like, to give that consistent long uh, lasting relationship with your customers, you have to charge a premium and you have to charge a price that is going to be sustainable so you can make a profit. What things to measure, keep track of when we discuss sales and marketing? Lots of things. A couple of ones that hit me right off the head are uh, close ratio and pr profit percentages. That's the big thing. Uh, you know, and against budgeted hours. So budgeted hours, profitability, and close ratio on sales and marketing. Those are a few that just pop into my head. Keith asks, the county I live in has around 75,000 people with average salary around 41,000 and with about 30 landscaping companies. What do you think realistic I could, do you think it's realistic I could grow a business with your model? So, 75,000 is pretty close to where we're at. In Whatcom County, I'm pretty sure we have about 81,000, 82,000 people in our county. And it's definitely possible. In our county alone, there's almost 100 landscaping companies. And that's like, that is, I know that for a fact, because we sent out uh, zero turn. We sent out the book to every landscaper in our county. And we sent out, I think, like 80 or 90. And we only looked at the ones online. Like the ones that were just like, just like guys driving down the street, we didn't, we couldn't find their address. I know we sent 80 to 90 books in our market. We have 81,000 people, 82,000 people in our market. And it's a college town too. So our age demographic skews low as well as income because it's a college town in Bellingham. And we still, this business is successful. That being said, we grew the business to one and a quarter million in a town that has less than 8,000 people. And, that was, and we scaled it to one and a quarter before we even moved to the larger uh, shop and the larger demo, like, uh, market. So... I do not believe that demographical populations like is a constraint on your business. And I do not believe that the number of businesses that are in lawn care is a constraint either. The more landscaping businesses there are, it means there's just more work to be had. And so again, it goes back to the question AB asked, like you just got to prove why you're better. And that means that there's plenty of work for you to take. Nick Snedden asked three questions, it looks like. Best way to drastically include, in, increase route density for mowing? We talked a little bit about that. Facebook ads, Google ads, EDDM, and door hangers in very targeted areas. So Facebook, you can target neighborhoods and then do the door hangers and things like that. Number two, when doing pay for performance, would you guarantee, guarantee a minimum hourly wage? Yes, by law, you have to pay the minimum wage, and we artificially raise that in a, at Augusta to a higher rate, just so that they have some sort of stability in their, in their workflow and in their pay. Number three, any tips for selling lawn care or mowing services door to door? Um, I would basically not do it as a pitch. I would do it as basically saying, hey, we're next door. Would you like, you know, just wondering if you ever need services, let us know, here's the card. I'm not into the high pitch, like the high pressure door to door. I'm much more like, hey, you know, maybe you don't mow the area. So, and you're just kind of coming in new. I would say, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm with such and such lawn care services. 
and we're new to the area and we just love to prove our professionalism and if there's ever anything you would need done in your lawn care or in in your landscaping just give us a call here's my name and number on this card or pamphlet or brochure or whatever we'd love you know we'd love to do business with you and just do that um if you are mowing in that area, that's really powerful because you can literally be having like a crew mowing and like be like, hey, we're just down the street pointing to your guys, hopefully a nice truck and a well-uniformed crew. And uh, we just wanted to introduce ourselves. Let, you know, we, Obviously, we, we do this property and this property and Mr. Jones across the street from you here, we do his property and dr- name drop. And then basically say we'd love to do services for you if you ever have the need just give us a call again low pressure but again using your crew and your because now when they drive by that property every single time and they look and looks really nice hopefully they're going to be thinking about your services and what you could do for them and their property all right one more question here nick steden asks when using pay for performance do you use the same system to judge employees performance for a mowing route versus a much higher dollar per man hour job like cleanups for example paying employees 30 percent of revenue for cleanups is much higher hourly wage than 30 percent while mowing um again this really is going to depend on your market this is going to depend on your pricing structure uh what type of services you're focused on so again at conference we're going to talk a lot about pay for performance and you can ask these questions and i can ant- get some more context but this is going to depend strictly based upon what your strategy is for your business like if your strategy is get people in the door with lawn care and then upsell them to higher priced and higher margin services you're going to flip pay for performance differently. If you have a model where you want to have consistent profit margins across all services, then you manipulate your budgeted hours as well as your hourly rates so that a guy working out mowing, when he does a good job, he can make just as much as someone doing cleanups or landscaping. That might mean bringing your rates down for mowing or for landscaping. But again, it's all about your business model, your demographic, your route density is a big deal. Your crew setups, like your equipment setups are gonna be a big deal uh, because you can artificially help the mowing crews get more money by simply giving them bigger equipment, nicer equipment, um, newer equipment. And so how you make that balance is completely predicated upon what you're business goals are and your market and your pricing and a whole bunch of other things. And so at conference, we are probably going to spend 40 to 50% of the time of conference developing your, developing your personalized pay for performance system. And so, um, I want everyone to leave there having a very clear system for their business specific for their business, not just because like I just threw out percentages or I just like gave it, you a ballpark, like doing that and it failing. And I've seen this happen. Companies just take a percentage that you know, they hear on a video or whatever, and they implement it. It doesn't work because they didn't customize it. And then the crew retaliates and they will never be able to institute pay for performance again, or at least for a long time. Like I know I just talked to a, a landscaper at GIE who, uh, you know, every single one of you would know if I mentioned his name and they tried do, instituting pay for performance about five, six years ago. And it didn't work because of that reason they had to stop it. And then they just recently been able to institute it because it's been some time now. And so so you do not want to do that. Like shoot yourself in the foot, lose money, lose employees over and create a huge amount. This is the biggest thing, huge amount of mistrust in the culture because you don't transition correctly. You don't explain it correctly. And then when it doesn't work, you got to, you got to rescind it and you got to take it away. It's absolutely horrible. And so, you know, if, if you don't do it correctly and you're giving them too much money, you could literally put yourself out of business or have to reduce their pay, which looks horrible to the employees, look like you're manipulating and using them, or you go and do the system and you're not charging, you're not um, giving them enough and it makes them mad because it feels like, again, you create the system just to artificially reduce their wages. And so you've got to go in with numbers, data, how do you make the transition and how do you customize it to your particular market, your services, your pricing, and what you want for the business. And so that's why at the conference, we're going to customize it. And I want you to leave the conference with a system in place that is going to be different than every other person at the conference. And so I'm working on that. It's going to be a big topic at the conference. And literally, it might be the majority of what we talk about. So that's all the questions for today. If you have a question and you want to ask me that, go to Landscape Business Course Group on Facebook and make sure that you ask me that next time I post a question 
a question and answers a request. Again, make sure you go to landscapebusinesscourse.com slash conference, book your tickets because last year we, the last week and a half or so, we couldn't get any more rooms at the hotel. And so make sure you book now and I promise you, you will not regret it. Thank you so much and have a great day.